My blood is boiling when someone tells that women cannot do something or people of certain race cannot do something. I don't think anything in this, this life is uh, not possible. Everything is possible. There was more, much more chances that the company would fail than grow statistically. So I have to make a life changing decision because I have like whole life planned in pharma. I had a corporate car, I had corporate travel, I had corporate insurance. And then there was guy, a guy with uh, 10 people in a very humble office. But I still decided to try because there was, it was new. And someone told me that this company not gonna make it. So it makes me angry. And then I jump in and I start working. Hey everybody, this week I'm joined by none other than Anna Klepchakova, the Chief Medical Officer at newly crowned unicorn and billion dollar company, women's health company, Flow. So Anna, welcome to the Health Tech Podcast. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you, James. Uh, how are you? I'm okay, I'm okay. A little bit intimidated now you're, uh, now you're a unicorn C-suite member, so I better be on my best behavior, eh? Like we were saying earlier, weren't we? Like you wake up as, uh, you wake up as chief medical officer of a unicorn and uh, you sort, you sort of like, oh God, have I got to dress differently? Have I got to like behave differently? Um, but what, yeah, what was it like waking up billion dollar, billion dollar C-suite? It was exciting, but again, like we were talking before the, this podcast that, uh, it's only in the fairy tale that you like wake up a princess. In real world, it's like a joy journey. So it took us seven seven years. No, for a company, it took like nine years. And I work for Flo. I've been working for Flo for seven years. So it was a journey. So yes, we. I woke up uh, one day, uh, a chief medical officer of a billion mm, dollar company. But nothing changed. Like mm. I woke up and I was tired. I have two kids. One of one of them is toddler. Another one is ten months old. So <laughs> the flat was a mess. Like my email <laughs> inbox was a mess. So nothing changed. Uh, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But definitely, uh, I think it's for a startup world. It's like winning an Olympic uh, games, like winning a gold medal. So we're happy, but we are tired. Yes. And I suppose unlike the Olympics, you've uh, you got to keep on running. Uh, the, the race doesn't stop here. Like you've, collect, <laughs> yeah, you've no, collected, we... you've collected your medal, but only you, you sort you, well, you've sort of been promised the medal, uh, but now you've, now you've got to run another few marathons uh, over hurdles, through puddles, uh, underneath barbed wire, et cetera. You've got to do all of that to then, uh, to then actually collect the medal, I guess. So, although even then, have and you collected it? Even if you, well, make the sponsors happy. <laughs> Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And then once the sponsors have been made happy, then, uh, then everyone else can get paid. But yeah, interesting. So I think what, what a lot of people might not know is you have a medical background, you've worked in pharma, you've done loads of cool things that sort of give you the right to be a chief medical officer full stop um and then obviously moving into startups and all the rest of it so it'd be great to hear a bit of that like what tell us your background tell us your story tell us how does one end up as the uh the princess in this story the uh the, the c-suite of a billion dollar company um yeah i think my story i should start my story with um uh, why I decided to become a doctor. I never thought I will be a doctor until someone told me that a uh, medical university in my country, I'm, I was born in Belarus, so the, the state medical university, that's the hardest university to get free education from. So like in my country, there was like two streams. If you don't have um, perfect academic excellence and knowledge you can pay for your education but if you want government to pay for your education you have to be you have to have really good um, marks you have to have uh, you have to pass the exams with like top grades 
as soon as I heard that medical university, that's the toughest place. You can't, you have to have best grades, you know, you can't make mistakes on, on the exam. I took it as a personal challenge. <laughs> I didn't like, there are no doctors in my family, no doctors in my network. I wasn't mm. exposed to medicine at all, but I thought mm. like, well, like it's a challenge. Can I do it? So I started, I was so like, it was one year before actually exams that I started to study biology and chemistry. And I failed my first exam. I failed to get uh, this governmental um, compensation. I had to pay for my studies and my family didn't have money. So I took another year to study like biology and chemistry more deeply. And this first failure actually motivated me to work harder and it was the the fuel that helped me to overcome challenges of like studying medicine when you have sleepless nights and so on so I was very motivated and then the second year I got excellent marks so I got this um, money for my education so I studied for free um, and it was challenging like and I, I think like anyone who has a medical degree knows that the amount of information you have to absorb is crazy. So I had my medical degree and then I think that is part of my character. And so if someone tells me that there is something, the problem you you can't solve or the place you can't get in, I will be the first <laughs> to knock at the door. So um, I wanted to become a surgeon. But then I had like health issues. I have migraines. I couldn't, it wasn't predictable. Like I didn't want to be a surgeon who in the middle of the operation has a migraine attack and like becomes ineffective. So I, I wanted, still wanted to do something hard and extreme. And I decided to do intensive care medicine. And when I was choosing which hospital to work for, the choice was go to a nice place with high salary and then the place uh, that usually don't take women because it's too hard, it's too challenging, it's like country level acute trauma center. So, you know, <laughs> you know what I did. I like, of course, uh, of course, I you applied did the hard for, thing. I, I applied for the second job because I, I, I believe that my life would be different if someone would tell me, okay, take this nice job because it's hard, no, like it's hard to get there. But for some reason, someone told me that this big hospital don't take women. They don't like, it's too hard to work. You can't survive. It's blood all over. Like you have to work 24 seven. So of course, like I said, give me two. I, I'm, I'm taking it. So I started to work as an intensive care uh, union doctor and anesthesiologist. I spent three years in that hospital. And then it kind of became a bit repetitive. Um, and I got bored. It's funny how you can get bored in acute trauma medical center, but I got bored and I thought that, okay, what else can I do? I had a passion for preventative medicine. I had a passion for innovation. I saw that you know, we lacked novel drugs. We lacked um, innovation in our hospital. So I thought maybe I should go and work for F Big Pharma because those are the guys who are bringing us new drugs, new technologies. So I applied, I started applying for different jobs in Big Pharma but no one wanted to take me because I didn't want to give up my hospital work. And then I found a job in one of the local farmers who said, okay, you should work nine to five in the office. And then what you do at night, we don't care. So I actually had for two years, I had two jobs at night. I would work in a hospital and then during the daytime, I would work in a uh, big pharma. What was your motivation for keeping both? Because I liked both. Okay. Good for you. <laughs> and I, I was young. I had the energy to do this. Probably now I wouldn't be able to have two <laughs> jobs. 
Um, but th back then it was, I really liked both worlds. Um, and pharma was different. And I would say moving from medical world into pharma was really painful for me. I had to change my mindset because when you work in intensive care in a hospital, people want you, people wait for you. People call you, they need help. When you enter the room, everyone is like looking at you. Oh my God, like you're mm -hmm. here. We're yeah. so happy. While you work in, when you work in pharma, it's to, like you're selling something. <laughs> so you have to come to people who don't want to see you. You have to talk to people who don't care about you. And that was very painful for my mm -hmm. ego to mm -hmm. change my mindset into it's, me who want to talk to people, not people who want to talk to me. Yeah. To be honest, I was crying maybe first months in pharma. I was crying every morning before wow. like get going to work because it was so painful that I had wow. to, to become more humble. So I think like pharma helped me a lot to get my current job because pharma, especially big pharma, like I worked at Takeda. Uh, as a marketing manager and Takeda, it's like biggest Japanese company in the world. It's like 200 years old. So pharma is a good school for really sol that gives solid knowledge of marketing, business, sales. So if you want to launch a new drug, pharma would give you all the frameworks. They would teach you the right things, how to calculate the, the P&L how to create go-to-market strategy. So pharma and what I learned there, I think it's like an equivalent of a business degree because I worked, I was responsible for launching new drugs. So I had to start from the beginning. I was creating product strategy, go-to-market strategy. I was calculating like forecasts of sales. So it was very comprehensive knowledge that I gained at pharma. It's a heck of a journey so far, if I may jump in. Um, it's funny that you're, you always want to do the hard thing, don't you? Like it's, it, I wonder where that comes from. Like, is that just something that you think you were born with that you just want to challenge yourself? You want to challenge norms? You want to challenge status quo? I mean, it, it's sort of, if it's part of you, I mean, it's ideal to end up in startups. I think if you're like that, but yeah, do you think, it, have you, were you born with that or do you have an experience that you can point to that you want to, um, that made you want to rebel against the norms? It's a good word, rebel. I think I was born with that. Uh, I f like my blood is boiling when someone tells that women cannot do something mm. or um, people of certain race cannot do something yep. or people from some country or so. I don't think anything in this, this life is uh, not possible. Mm. Everything is possible. It's just the matter of time and effort. You will invest in solving a particular problem. Mm. And I guess, like, I think you also worked in intensive care, right? What so is? I think this stressful environment attracts certain people. You enjoy working in a stressful environment only if your brain is built up particular way. I don't want to go deep into like neurobiology, but certainly probably some of some parts of my brain are designed the way that I like stressful environments. I like novelty. Um, and I think that's why I felt really comfortable in intensive care. And I feel now comfortable with uh, working in a startup environment where, you know, you can get a message any day, oh, like we have a huge problem. So when I get the message starting with, we have a huge problem, we need to talk ASAP, I feel curiosity. Mm. I don't feel anxiety. Yeah. That's a really interesting word that always comes up on this podcast, by the way, curiosity. I think it's such a it's such an important trait for ending up in like startup leadership because without that curiosity, I don't think that you are interested in the innovation side of things and the curiosity i think is just the uh, you mentioned the word fuel before i think curiosity is such a fuel that 
allows people to maintain the energy uh, when uh, you know days and startups are not always that pleasant are they but it's yeah it's funny like intensive care it made me reflect then like why why did i like it because i I wouldn't say that I enjoyed stressful environments, but then obviously the data suggests that I do. Um, I think it's more that for me personally, I think it's more that I, I, I will take a stressful environment because what I want, I want to spend my time doing something important and doing something meaningful, doing something purposeful. It was the, and you mentioned the, the repetitive nature of intensive care being something that got to you, that got to me too, because as soon as it became repetitive, especially the anesthetic side, I don't know how much anesthesia. Oh yeah, I hated anesthetics. Right. (laughs) I mean, I, I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed the anesthetic side. But after two years of doing it, like, as you well know, like the repetitive nature of anesthetics, I was like, man, like the computers could run these things. Like <laughs> the algorithms could run these things because I'm just sort of doing an algorithm. And these, I remember saying to my anesthetic consultants at the time, I remember sitting in, in uh, it was just a, like a lap coli list. It wasn't anything. I mean, that, that was part of the story, actually. It wasn't anything like, it wasn't an ITU patient being operated on. It was elective. It was lap coli's. It was something that every anesthetist has got their way of doing it. And they react somewhat to things that are in the surgical field or they react if the, you know, if the blood pressure does something or if there's a pain response or whatever. They, they, they'll have a set of things that they do, but it was all very repeatable. I remember saying to, to this anesthetist at the time, like, couldn't you just like, record all the information through the anesthetic machine so if you gave metaraminol if you gave ephedrine if you gave morphine if you gave you know a bit of extra you know alfentanil or whatever if you if you gave it through the anesthetic machine so that it knew what you were doing then surely you could record all this data and then if every anesthetic machine in the world did this and unified a single data set would not would we then not be able to deliver the perfect anesthetic each time because we know if it's got all the patient data if it's got a camera on the surgical field if it's listening to what's going on in the operating room and we're able to label all of this stuff and then it notes response i was like surely surely we can we can just develop something that that like very ob- ob- like <laughs> objectively says like what is the perfect anesthetic Anyway, this anesthetist was just like, what on earth are you talking about? Like this, like, just, just please be quiet and just, just learn something. Like, tell me the causes of blah again. Like, tell me the pharmacology of this again. I was like, I don't want to tell you the pharmacology. What, what a waste of, what a waste of my energy t- telling you something that's already in the history books and the textbooks. Like, I remember getting so frustrated. Like, why do you revise for all these exams? Imagine if every anesthetist and every ICU doctor that has to revise for those ludicrous exams, like learning the, the, like the, the physics circuitry of an anesthetics machine or a, or a, or a defibrillator. I was like, imagine if we put all this energy into like innovation projects and like moving the specialty forwards rather than like learning what's already happened. Like I said, the, the whole thing was just bizarre to me. But anyway, thinking like that is, is not, medicine is not the place for you if you think like that, which is what I learned. Um, and you're right. You use the word humbling when you went into pharma. I think this is the other thing that I want to pull out here. Like the, this, this was such an important lesson for me as well. Like, as soon as you as soon as you leave medicine into an environment where you're not you're not itu on call itu on call as you quite rightly say is is glorious at times like you you get bleeped you swan down into a and e you intubate someone that no one else can do you save their life you do all these things because everyone else's like life support training stops at and then i call the anesthetist so our kind of uh, <laughs> our skill set starts where everyone else finishes, so we can only ever be the hero because we're only the escalation. It's, it's just that we haven't got a clue how to do anything else. But it, you know, it's it's misplaced. Uh, it's probably in my case anyway. It's certainly misplaced arrogance or misplaced uh, ego, perhaps. But um, yeah, very, very, very humbling when I left. It's hard to switch from being a superhero or a person that everyone loves like santa claus to being <laughs> ordinary you no know, yeah yesterday you was a santa claus people loved you they were expecting you and now no one wants to open the door because yeah. you're actually the person who is selling you know like i don't know bibles <laughs> well yeah so it's hard mental shift you must have felt like you were growing though right like because you 
you left, you said you were having this humbling experience in pharma. I think a lot of people will be feeling this. There's a lot of clinicians, a lot of medics that that are leaving medicine or are doing something extra and are probably having that humbling experience thinking, oh, this might not be for me. They might be, you know, worried that maybe this isn't sustainable. Maybe I'll, maybe medicine is my safe space and all those things. Maybe it is, maybe that is part of the answer, but you must have enjoyed that humbling nature of it. You must have enjoyed or thought that you were learning or growing. Like, why did you stick with it? Was I enjoying humbly? No, it was painful. I think any mental change of your like mental programs is painful. But you are a bit of a masochist from from the positions that you put. You, like you, you, you do kind of seek out the hard thing, though. So you must get something from it. It's rewarding in some way. No, it's rewarding again. But this is part of my nature, you know. Like I was thinking, which sport would I like to do when I have time? Yeah, and I would never do just I don't know cycling. I would do triathlon because it's diversity. <laughs> so I think I enjoy new things, and I. I think life is so short that I want to mm. try as many roles as possible, as many, I want to put as many hats as possible because when I will be dying and I saw people dying in intensive care unit, yeah, they were like talking to me and they were like, they were sorry that they didn't try things. Wow. So they like, I think what, what I remember uh, people who were aware of the fact that they're dying, they were sorry that they didn't spend enough time with their family, and then they, that they didn't try different things. So two main regrets that they had. Mm. So that's why I think I tried to go with the interest. So I wanted to try something new, and I didn't have enough uh, knowledge about tech at that time. So maybe if if there was tech offers or tech opportunities, I could move from medical field to tech. But because there was no tech at the time, I moved to the next best place I knew about, pharma. I think it was a great move because, again, it's like university. They teach you everything, finance, marketing, business, yeah. sales, negotiations. I was exposed to so many smart people key opinion leaders, like top professors, international like marketers. So it's a huge, huge industry with a lot of knowledge, a lot of impact. And I was, I'm super grateful to people who invested in me, mm. who gave me the knowledge, gave me the opportunities to try new things. So pharma was amazing. What, what was it like having your eyes opened to... You mentioned the word business there, like s selling, you've mentioned as well, money, profit, how that relates to healthcare. Like, how is it having your eyes open to that side of healthcare? Because you're, you're still operating, as, well, not operating, but you're still working as a clinician, aren't you, in intensive care? And you're seeing very much the socialist side of medicine there. And then all of a sudden, you, you're witness to, yeah, okay, they're not being important in the humbling from an individual perspective, but also you're learning about the system. You're learning about the way money moves. You're learning that pharma companies need to make profit and in order to do their R&D, in order to bring new drugs. And was, 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 that, was that interesting? Was that hard? Was that something you found quite easy? It was eye-opening because when, you work, when I worked in the, as a doctor in the hospital, like we were trained to maybe by parents, by the system, we never talked about money. So you just get your salary. You can't negotiate it much. You don't think about the cost of the drugs. You don't think about the cost of the procedures and so on. That's the job of like head of department or head of hospital. If, but when you move, when I moved to Big Pharma, I realized that there is a whole new world around us, the money thing, the P&L side of any business. Uh, I re realized why some drugs are available in a particular country and why other drugs are not available. And um, it was painful again, because if you think about from so socialistic point of view, well, it's not fair that we don't have a, hmm. like novel drugs in a small country. But then when you know the business side of things, you understand that like your PNL wouldn't work 
if you don't have enough patients, you can't bring this drug in because your expenses will be five times higher than the possible revenue. And yes, it's business. And if the government doesn't want to pay for it, no way you will get those drugs into the com- country. Mm. So I think it helped me to open my uh, eyes to mm. see more. And yeah. it's always good when you have like bigger picture. Yes. And the reason I ask all this, by the way, is because the next part of your story is obviously moving to flow. And I think, I, I'm i sure you do too. You get a lot of messages from people, particularly clinicians and people within medicine that want to move into startups. And I don't, I don't think that it's necessarily a linear, it might, well, it might be a linear path, but it goes through a few other stops potentially to end up in startups in quite a meaningful way. And I think that's because without the understanding of that business side, without the understanding of the financial side, without the understanding of what it takes to actually innovate, I think it's actually hard to be, to be very useful for a startup unless you want to pigeonhole yourself like very, very like narrow into clinical because if you've only done clinical then your value is only clinical you're talking about an experience that has spanned not only the clinical but then everything that you learned in pharma which then puts you in a position to to understand so much more about how a startup can innovate within the system just simply because you're you're understanding of the system is so much more was that intentional for you you, did you always have your eye on startups or were you just following your interest and startups just became a very good idea for me i was just following my interest and i i never wanted to leave pharma because in my network in my country it was already very bold to move from hospital to pharma and then from Mm, local pharma to global pharma. So it was like top, top achievements. And then I had a like nice uh, career plan ahead. I was in this talent pool, young promising talents at oh, Takeda. Wow. So I was expecting to be promoted, maybe go to a different country to work. And then when I, someone, my friend told me that there is a small company, they're looking for a doctor. They're actually not looking for a doctor. They're looking for to talk to a doctor with a business background just to talk about their project. So that's how I met our CEO, Dmitry Gursky. It was just a conversation about, you know, mm. what do you think about the company? What do you think we should need to do? And then the conversation turned into uh, a hiring interview. Interesting. <laughs> And then I didn't want to take a job, uh, but then we ended up agreeing that I will do a test task. <laughs> so I, I took a test task and I was still thinking, okay, uh, okay, it's I can do a test task because the test task was about defining a unique selling proposition for Flo, and it was more about marketing than medicine. And I was like, okay, cool. That's a new sector. I have no idea about the sector. Maybe I should do this. And then I I already booked a holiday and paid for the tickets to Italy. And but I had a week to do the test test. So I spent whole holiday sitting in a house next to the sea. And I never actually went out to take a walk because there was a huge amount of knowledge I needed to digest to come up with unique selling proposition because you have mm. to understand the industry, you have to uh, look at the competitors, you have to understand the product to come up with something valuable. So like, it was a miserable holiday because I spent whole time sitting at home just drinking coffee and reading, reading and writing. And then because I did a test task, I already learned a lot about the industry and I yeah. realized this is an industry industry and then we talked to Dmitry again I made another task (laughs) so I made two tasks because he wasn't sure if I was the right person if he needed me at this point or maybe he needed someone without him like business background so I did another test task and then he gave me an offer to join and then I realized, oh gosh, this is serious I have to make a life changing decision because Mm. I have like whole life planned in pharma. I have my career track 
very clear. I mm. see it where I will be in 10 years, what kind of salary I will get. I had a like corporate car. I had corporate travel. I had corporate insurance. Like I was living like really fancy life. Mm. And then there was guy, a guy with a 10 people in a very small mm, office, very humble office, no corporate car, no corporate lunch, uh, no perks, no corporate insurance. And it, for me, it's actually, it was a step. I don't know if it was a step back, but it wasn't a step forward in terms yeah. of money or uh, perks or perspectives. Like there was more, much more chances that the company would fail mm. than grow statistically. But I still decided to try because there was, it was new. And someone told me that you're not going to make it. Like this company not going to make it. And then some, like the answer is clear. They told mm. me that we will not going to make it. I, so How do you it write makes that name me down? angry. And then I jump in and I start working. Mm. I think someone from pharma told me that this is silly. You're not going to make it. <laughs> like the company not going to make it. And I was like, okay. Yeah, it's funny this, what an interesting decision to make and what an interesting move. And I think, I think everyone that has left a stable career to join a startup will have had someone tell them what a terrible idea it is, because you're absolutely right. Statistically, it is. It is absolutely a terrible idea statistically. If your metric is, I don't know, like the percentage chance of a certain, I don't know, salary or pension or lifestyle or something, if you're optimizing for that, if you're optimizing for the highest percentage chance of a certain lifestyle for the rest of your life, then yeah. That is a that is a bad decision because you definitely had a greater chance of that. But everything that you've explained in your story so far explains exactly why you made that decision, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, but at that point in your life, you weren't valuing that. You were valuing something different. You were valuing new experience. You were valuing uh, learning new things. You were valuing being part of something meaningful you did the task and for all it ruined the holiday in inverted commas you you enjoyed it you in, you enjoy doing the hard thing you enjoy proving other people wrong you enjoy proving that you can do something yourself and the personal growth associated with that so there are so many reasons why this was a good decision for you but i you know i can remember for example leaving and this was not a high risk maneuver by the way i was leaving clinical medicine to go to uh the, the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management's fellowship scheme, a very safe move because then you can go off and do lots of things within medicine or, you know, in the back end of healthcare or whatever. But I can, I can remember saying to my clinical supervisor at the time that, hey, I'm not going to sit my anesthetic exams because chances are I'm just going to take a job from within healthcare in a different place. Like we're going to go and do this fellowship for a year. And it was it was like the, the guy's like computer broke in his mind. It was just like, but but you 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 got to sit your exams. And I was like, why? Why have I got to sit my exams? Because I'm leaving. No, no, no. But you, but you 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 have to sit your exams though because everyone sits their exams. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. Like I'm not, I'm just not going to sit my exams and I'm going to be fine. He's like, no, you're not going to be fine. Like you, you're not going to be fine unless you sit your exams. I was like, why would I need my exams? I'm not staying. No, but you have to stay. You have to sit your. <laughs> so it's like. The, it's the same thing with pharma, right? Like if you're going to ask for people that are listening, that are thinking of leaving a safe career to go and join a startup, please don't expect the people around you to understand your framework unless you give them all the context. And I think that's the thing with advice is that I think it's completely fair and reasonable to go and get advice. I think it's completely fair and reasonable to ask people about your decision and people offer plenty of unsolicited advice, but you have to understand their framework and where they're coming from and where their life experience has got them. And, you know, the decisions that they've made that have worked out, the ones that haven't worked out for all, you know, they've joined a startup that hasn't worked and they're trying to do the best for you and all that sort of stuff. But 
Yeah, I imagine there was quite a lot of naysayers to that decision, but I also imagine that for you, none of that mattered because actually, well, you tell me, like, it must be that none of it mattered because you wanted to make the decision for all, all those reasons that it affected you, right? I think it's not easy to give advice, as you said, to someone because people have different motivations. And for me, changing one industry to another and then like pharma to tech was about trying to live different lives, becoming a different Anna. And for me, life is a journey. I like challenge because it makes me a different person. Each industry has different rules and different values. And the person that I was working in a hospital was different from pharma Anna and different from IT uh, Anna. And even the way I dressed is different. My hair color was different. So as I said, I like to 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 try living different uh, lives with different values and see which one fits me more. But because I stayed in IT at Flow for seven years, and before that I was changing jobs every three years, I I think this is the right place for me so far. I don't know. Maybe someone would come and tell me it's not possible to I don't know to edit genes. <laughs> and then I'm going to say, forget about flaw. I'm going and, you know, solving this problem. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But again, what I saw in this industry, I mean, health tech, what I saw in this company flaw, it really matched my values mm -hmm. and my goals. So that's why I stick um, to this for so long. That's beautiful. So were you were you the first hire or certainly amongst the first few? I think I was number 12. So oh, when wow. I nice. came, there were like definitely Android, iOS developers, content managers, legal advisor, CEO, CPO. Yeah. So okay. like, but core team. So yeah. I joined very early. Yeah. So tell me about Flow then in like seven years ago. Was it seven years ago? It was roughly seven years ago, wasn't it? Um so I joined seven so, yeah. years ago. It was a small company with very small budget. For people who don't know Flow, looking from now to Flow, maybe you, people may think that we had lots of money, we had lots of expertise. <laughs> but actually, the situation was that we weren't first in this market. So there were already companies from Berlin, from the US, from China, who were like market leaders in the category of period tracking apps. Um, they had more investment. Um, and we, we really wanted to do our best to compete. We never thought we would become a market leader, but actually we became one in two years. But what we did, we just invested our efforts in building best product. It may sound too simple, but it's actually not as simple uh, as it sounds because you have to talk to the users, you have to understand what they need, what you can do better. And I think our competitive advantage was the fact that we invested heavily in design. So we made it much simpler for the user. It was simple design and we invested in medicine and science. So we wanted the app to be medically credible and scientifically backed and we spent no money on marketing first three or four years so it was only organic growth but we spent money on medical board so we hired um, medical board members who were like best experts in uh, female health and we paid them as consultants to help mm. us build better product from medical perspective. And I think that was key to success. So we tried to invest not in marketing, but in technology and medicine. And it worked because users would compare the product. They would pick flow for simplicity, for accuracy, for, um, for the content that would explain them basic things about their body. And when you have more users, good ratings in App Store and Google Play, you get more installs organically. So I think we spent three or four years without even user acquisition, paid user acquisition. And we became a market leader without 
actually invest in much in marketing. But it's unique. I wouldn't advise anyone now because probably the market is different, but that's what we had. We had no money for marketing. We only could pay to like to the team and that's it. Mm. Was that a very deliberate decision then by the leadership to, I guess you guys, to essentially say like, in order for us to differentiate here, this is this is how we're going to differentiate. Was that was that a, was that a very clear direction that was set? We're going to look at medical credibility. We're going to look at design, and that collectively is how we win on product. Yeah, I think like, but you know what I see, company companies' values or the product values is usually a reflection or a proxy of the founder's values. Right. So that's the kind of values we had. Me and Mitri, who were like on the medical science side, uh, mm. Max, our CPO, who was for, like, for design. So that's who we are and that's what we translated into product. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Um and you said market leaders within two years. That's a really interesting journey because, as you say, starting at a time where there are others in the market, it's not easy to to start there. It's not easy to to then get traction enough so that you can even compete, let alone to become market leaders. Is that is that something about the app space that the barrier to entry is such that people can just get in? Is that something... Is it something there potentially? Is it like that low barrier to entry let you in and then you focused on product and then word of mouth and all that stuff made it better? Like what what do you think allowed for you to kind of get in with less spend and then overtake? I think prioritization and focusing on what matters. So I think like with every company, every startup, you have limited resources. You have limited time, limited money, or limited human resources. So you have to pick what is the most important. For us, the most important was uh, user experience mm. and good user experience and trust, high trust, because we had like every article reviewed by a medical expert and we had faces of those right. people who would disclose who was reviewing and making sure that this product is good. So this translated into trust and then trust translated into high app store ratings, uh, installs, word of mouth. So to your question um, about is it low barrier of entry uh, to the industry? I don't think so because I think now everyone is trying to develop an app for any problem in the world. <laughs> yeah. So there are hundreds of period trackers. There are right. hundreds of sleep trackers. Yeah. To become successful, I guess you have to understand what is the most important thing that you can focus on. What is your competitive advantage? And it can be the price. It can be design, depending on like what your users want. So obviously at the, at the time of, well, I was going to say at the time of starting, and of course, until now, um, it's a women's health company in a women's health space. And the women's health space or femtech space, as people, some people call it, um, probably looked very different at the beginning to what it does now. Um, but I guess because I have you here, it'd be nice to talk about some of those terms, what they mean to you, and I guess a little bit of your some of your thoughts around the femtech space. So um first of all the word femtech i remember being on a panel uh one of our google events and the panel there didn't actually like the term femtech um and actually much preferred women's health and actually would rather do away with it all entirely because ultimately <laughs> why are we singling out women's health as a term when it's literally half the population we don't talk about men's health in the same way um what are your thoughts on the term femtech femtech versus women's health like do you have thoughts around the language there I think femtech is technology that is designed to help with particular women health issues like menopause or pregnancy, menstrual health. Women health, for me, it's a broader term that covers not only female-specific conditions, but also conditions that affect men and women, but maybe affect differently, like diabetes. I wouldn't say that I'm very protective of 
femtech term or I'm opposite, mm. I would say that the problem that we have is women get less solutions to help with their specific health needs. That mm -hmm. was historically, uh, that, that happened historically. Uh, there is less funding in women health, uh, research. There is less funding in female startups, like female focused startups. I think only 2% of money goes to health tech startups that focus on women's health. I think there are probably 13 times more research into erectile dysfunction than in menopause. So Oof. I feel there is a inequality in terms of who gets more attention, women mm. or men, women health challenges or men health challenges. Mm. And I wish it could be equal. Mm. So if femtech term will help, to attract yeah. attention and investment, I will be like an advocate of it. So for me, the name is less important, the attention is important. And mm. that's why I'm here. Like, I don't like to, I'm not a public person. I don't like to talk publicly, but I feel that if people who work in femtech, doctors who work with female patients, Patient, women who experience health challenges, they would become more vocal about uh, what they see, what they face. It will create attention and attention may lead to investment solutions and so on. And because there is still so much stigma around women health, you know, being pregnant, facing postpartum challenges, I believe it's my job as a female and a femtech mm, employee some tech company employee to talk about it mm. yeah it's a, i guess it all starts with language doesn't it and it starts with making sure that we are using the right terminology and if we are using the right terminology then the more people that talk about it the better for all the reasons that, that you've spoken about and you know part of the reason that you know you're on today and we've had like Shined from bb biome recently and helen o'neill and like she came to our live event and all that sort of stuff. Obviously, my my wife and co-founder Jessica is pregnant, and so I have the Flow app. I have the Partner app. Thank I have. You. I'm just trying. No, you're welcome. Thank you. It's great. I, like, I say, it's not an ad for Flow. This is. It's just you know, it is. It's been incredibly useful. But I'd say that from from my perspective, and I have a you know what perspective. I guess as someone, I'm not I'm not just a, a a man. I'm a man in the health tech space. I've been I mean, in healthcare, like all this sort of stuff. Like I do, I find it easier perhaps to to feel more connected to women and their health. Um, but from what I've seen, like particularly what Flo are doing with the partner app, I think it's a gateway for not only women to talk about it more and you know, women in positions that can invest and that can make impact to talk about it more and therefore to start more of a movement. It's, I, I think actually things like the partner app are a really good way for men to get involved because I think the, it's, it's, as you say, the stigma. And I think for, for men to even use some of the terms for anatomy and things like that, it's, it's, a, it's in a strange place. I think the more that people do talk, the better though. And I think the more that we can all be part of this movement the better so anything that enables that is important so things like us coming to an agreement on language you know men getting involved in whatever way they can um is obviously important that's not obviously to detract from this is a women's health problem and all the rest of it but um yeah i, I guess it's a commentary on the fact that it's been easier recently for me to be uh, an advocate i guess it's been easier recently for me because of Jess being pregnant, because of me learning more about that side of things, being a doctor anyway, there's a lot of reasons that it's been easier for me. Um, but it'd be nice to see that trend continuing, I guess, and for more of the population at large to, to feel more connected into it, because you're right. The, all the data suggests that women don't get the funding. All the data suggests that women founders are not in, the same position of privilege as male founders um, and and therefore they're the ones that are going to start the majority of, you know, the women's health companies and that kind of thing. So 
but I, but it has it feels like it has been changing at least somewhat recently. It does feel, as I say, easier to talk about it now than it did even a year or two ago, frankly. And I think that's partly because of companies like yourself that have. I mean, how many users have you got now? Like, I have seventy million, million monthly active million, yeah. users, and I guess almost <laughs> I mean, three hundred eighty million installs. So a lot. So it's incredible, isn't it? That it's a big audience. Are, yeah. But you know what's interesting is that there are there are women now that throughout their entire they're gonna have data on their entire reproductive journey as a human. Their entire uh like menstrual cycle is going to be recorded. And for them as individuals, and you know, obviously that has value to use a company and what you can do to make impact for those people down the line, but for those individuals, the, the, some of them now will will uh, all they will know is recording their health through flow about this part of their life. All they will know is becoming more informed. It will be easier for them as young girls. I would hypothesize for them to talk about these things more because they're all recording this sort of thing. I mean, is is that is that something that you've noticed? Is that a trend that you think is? is growing because as i say year on year it is it is feeling a bit easier to to talk about this it does feel more in the discourse that we are talking more about women's health and femtech i agree with you so things are changing uh women's health gets more attention not maybe not enough but still more and what i see as you mentioned the data that we have the education that we provide makes women more confident. We empower them to go and get help, to ask questions, to challenge the existence. So like you can't imagine how bad the situation with health literacy is in the world. And that's, I think, that is the root cause of all prob- most of the problems that we have. Um, we, we often conduct studies to measure health literacy and let's say about UK 75% of women they get more information online in social media about health than they get from their doctors or credible resources Mm. Um, half of the women don't know what is ovulation Um, (sighs) half of the women who are entering menopause, they don't know enough about what Mm. to expect. So health literacy, that's the big problem. Because if you don't know, you can't control. You Mm. can't ask for help. And what is making my blood boil uh, in a bad way, when I go to Instagram and I see this fitness coach is saying, oh, you have a period pain. If you have a period pain... That's the problem with your tight muscles. You, so you have to do functional trainings if you have severe period pain. But actually, the first thing they need to do is go and do the ultrasound because it can be endometriosis, it can be cancer, whatever. And misinformation problem in social media is so severe that it just makes things even worse. So what we see and what is our goal we want to use the data that we have, so self-reported data around periods, symptoms. We want to use the medical knowledge that we have, that the medical board, people who are OBGYNs, who are people with profound knowledge, so want to marry it and want to make sure that we will tell each user about possible health issues about their next best things they can do to Mm. fix their health problems. So we want to improve health literacy. And we had a study measuring the effects of it. So we granted flow for free in low and middle income countries. And we measured how it affected health literacy and menstrual stigma. So even delivering basic information about periods, uh, contraception improves health outcomes and decreases menstrual stigma. 
So we decided to give away floor for free to 1 billion women um, in more than 66 countries because we believe that if we will fix this health literacy problem, things might change significantly. Mm. Because we can forget, can't we, that when we when we live in our bubble here, we think that these are the only problems that exist. Whereas actually, what you're doing is you're correcting a global health issue. the um, the the challenge of the challenge of social media being so accessible as well to those 66 countries is enormous. And I've said this for a long time. Like that, there's just for me, there's the without people like yourself and and others like filling this gap that there is no credible brand or place for people to access high quality health information. And the the problem with social media is that it is a great equalizer. Um, of course you can grow brand and followers and, and that kind of thing to, to increase the amount your stuff is seen, but ultimately, you know, one message seen in one place can almost carry the same weight as another message seen in another place. And, I know this is the sort of thing that the health shelf and YouTube are doing to try and like promote the best content and, and, and things like that. But I think it's a really interesting move by you guys with 70 million users, you know, across the world, like it, monthly active users across the world. Like it's, um, it's a lot of impact you can make and you, the, the effort that you put into the content therefore has to be up there right like and imagine this falls under your remit that the content that's put on your app you said from day one has received like heavy medical invest like the investment that you've put into that side of it has always been quite high that's been part of your company values so what what does that department look like now like from a from a you know looking at health literacy and, and stuff in 66 countries and everything that you're doing for content in, in the uk and and wider as well like you must have to create uh, we'll not only create a lot of content, but actually validate a lot of that content and keep that content up to date as well. And and there must be a heck of a repository and a heck of a bank of information on there. So, um, yeah, how very like I guess practically combating that health literacy piece is is a, is a content um, uh, probably largely a content solution. So, like, what does that look like for you guys now? Well, we have like we have four hundred forty people in the company and. 22 people who are medical and research scientists, who are medical doctor and research scientists who help the company to create features that make sense medically, validate the features, scientifically validate it. And then we have like a hundred, more than 100 medical board members who help us to do the cross review because like, we want to make sure that we have best experts with the latest knowledge who would look in our look at our content or our features and will just tell us, yes, guys, you're doing the right thing. So uh, the amount of efforts we are investing in med medical and scientific credibility is enormous. You're right. And um, I believe that is our unique competitive advantage because like, look at the social media that we discussed. There is no accountability uh, in App Store and Google Play for medical misinformation. Yes, they have some rules, like, but still they don't have like a medical team who would check every app and every statement. So it's kind of self-regulated. Yes, you have governmental bodies like in the US, it's FTC, FDA, who are supposed to monitor, but the amount of apps is immense. So mm, actually, if the company is not doing the medical and legal scientific evaluation of their product themselves. There is no one else who would probably do it for them and will point out on the inconsistencies or, or misinformation. And the same goes to bloggers. So you mentioned YouTube initiative about health shelf. I think it's amazing because if we want to fight health literacy, the knowledge we provide, they have to be best. Otherwise, you know, like we may damage it. And we've seen it in COVID, you know, people were doing random things to treat COVID, drinking bleach and so on. And like, because of the misinformation campaign. Yeah. Which is why I think you guys building the brand that you have, the, the then the dissemination of high quality information just becomes like so, so, so important and so impactful. And 
yeah, being a, we talked about trust at the beginning, right? Tr- a trusted brand is just so, so, so needed. Um, on the femtech space, you guys obviously raising and billion dollar valuation. There's a lot of attention on this now. There's a lot of attention um, on on the company, what you're doing, the space in general. What I mean, do you think that this this raise, you guys, and the success that you're having, do you think that this will have a positive effect on the on the women's health and femtech space? Uh, yeah, do you see? Uh, do you see? Do you, I guess you might hope for people to be inspired and all the rest of it to start companies, more investment to come in. Like, do you see this helping? I I believe it's helping yeah. because we've seen it um, happening already. I think Maven Clinic was the first that raised uh, money to become a unicorn in twenty twenty one. I think they raised one hundred ten million, and then billion to one, and then us. So. The market works uh, in a simple way. So if investors see that someone is giving money to femtech companies, they would start probably monitor this market better. They would start proactively to mm-hmm. search for other companies who might compete with Flow. So I, I yeah. expect that our competitors would raise some money because like, our evaluation proved that market exists that Mm. we can monetize users who want to improve their health. So I see a positive trend and there is a projection that uh, Femtech will market with worth 60 billion by 2027. Mm. So I would expect more companies entering this space. Yeah. And uh, we're looking forward to it because um, it's a new market. There is plenty of space for everyone. And a good competition, I think it always fuels creativity. Uh, I was well. I was actually going to say that you, you strike me as someone who uh, who values a bit of competition. I value competition because if you don't have competition, you just become too relaxed, <laughs> too chilled, lazy. And if some someone is like biting your feet behind you, you would start running faster. Yeah, uh, but. Again, the market is big and I, I'm really looking forward to see more companies entering because we may partner with someone and we actually like now considering more partnerships. So interesting. I also think that this podcast is an opportunity for me to voice over the fact that we are looking for partners. Mm. We, like we have a big audience and I don't think we are able to serve every need in this market. Mm. So there are like needs for testing, needs for maybe physical product sales. So Mm. I'm really looking forward to getting in touch with more companies to see how we can work together to help our users uh, with their health. That's really, that's really interesting. So just on, just on those partnerships, I mean, what, can you just add a bit more detail on that? Like what sort of companies, like what sort of partnerships are you looking at? Yeah, just give us a bit more of a flavor of that. Uh, let's look our, at our audience. So they are women all over the world who want to mm. improve their health. Mm. They are teenagers, they're pregnant, they're trying to conceive, they're like entering menopause. And um, each user segment has their own health needs. So imagine in perimenopause or menopause, we would probably look for partners who can help to alleviate the symptoms or treat the symptoms or diagnose this condition. So it's not an easy answer what kind of partners we're looking for. The list is very (laughs) long. We would need to probably like a whole podcast, but um, because we have a big audience in every stage of their life um Mm. like i believe the list of partners can be long as well Mm. awesome so my next question is then like what what are you what are you most excited about because for you personally you like doing the hard things you like building things you're creative you're uh constantly challenging yourself you wake up as the you know the billion dollar c-suite in a startup you're you're in that now and so 
looking forward, you now, I assume, you'd hope anyway, you've got a bit more of a budget for things. You've got the ability to, to, you've obviously got lots of things that you're asked now to do, but you have the ability to now do more and different things. So what's Flow going to do? What can we expect? Um, and I guess for you personally, what are you most excited about? I'm most excited about AI, although it became kind of popular <laughs> and I want yeah, to be yeah. special. I want to be excited about <laughs> something that no one knows, but I'm like everyone. I'm excited about mm. AI and I'm doing master's now uh, at Oxford for AI and oh, business. Sure. And with all your free time, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the few minutes that I have and I'm super excited. <laughs> Because I believe in real world data and uh, I think we don't realize that uh, we've been collecting, Not I'm not talking only about flow, like pharma has been collecting data um, from research, electronic health records has been collecting data, flow and companies like flow have been collecting data and we didn't have tools to analyze this data properly. And, you know, give the results to the users or patients. So mm. now I have my electronic health records scattered around the globe in different countries. <laughs> and for me, even for me, a doctor who works in tech, it's really hard to track my iron levels. I was trying to understand whether I'm iron deficient or no, and what should I do next? And I was just trying to find my lab results and yeah. understand, okay, like, should I take iron or not? And it was like a challenge. I spent the week, you know, trying to read and so on. Imagine this person who doesn't have those capabilities. So we have huge amount of data on every person that potentially has so much power to change their lives and we are not using it. So that's the most exciting thing for me. I'll try to push this, you know, idea into flow and make it happen somehow. But I don't believe we will have more money invested in health systems. Um, and I think that digital solutions, AI, those chatbot, chatbots that everyone hates that give medical advice. But I think... This is the right way to go, to use cheap, affordable, available health technologies to improve health literacy, to improve health awareness, to empower people to learn more about their bodies, to maybe give them confidence that they can go and buy some food supplements and without going to the doctor because the algorithm medically validated, created by doctors, advise them to do so. I'm saying this and I'm afraid to get criticism, as you said <laughs> previously. Uh, someone would, of course, say that this is not, not the right way to develop uh, technology, but I think we are not doing, by, like healthcare systems are failing to meet maybe even 5 7% of uh, medical needs of the population. And I saw this myself when I had two babies uh -huh. and postpartum care is not, not the best. I've seen hospital systems in different countries. And again, I was left uh, alone Googling, <laughs> reading floor articles on what should I do with myself, with my baby? It's so crazy, there is a huge gap. There is a huge gap. You're like, there is. Women are left alone in most of the situation. In, in situations mm. like usually we are alone when we have our first periods and we still think we are dying because mm. no one tells us about it. We are left alone with the crying baby and we don't know how to, what is the proper latch. Mm. No one tells mm. us about it. So um, I think technologists should do this simple work, helping people to get access to basic health knowledge. And of course, AI can help. And, uh, you know, we've spoken about this on the other podcast, the Health Pigeon podcast as well. Like, it, yeah, absolutely. And I think where healthcare doesn't exist, AI can definitely do a job. Um, 
But yeah, I'll leave that there without getting into more debate on it. But you mentioned being a parent. And this is obviously something that I can ask selfishly as well about, you know, Jessica and I about to become parents in December, all being well. Um, how does how does one uh, lead a startup, in start, well, in startup leadership, uh, a, mas- a master's at Oxford, two children and being present for them? Um yeah. And I say that because, you know, Jess and I want to want to co-parent and, and we've talked about the leave that we want to take and like all that sort of stuff. And, um, yeah, you know, I have friends actually as well that are mums, that are dads that want to really share in that parenting journey as well. So I'm definitely not just talking about being a mum here, although obviously, um, especially, you know, post birth there, there will be a lot more, uh, requirement for Jess to recover and things like that than, than me who has, you know, pleasantly sat on the sidelines doing absolutely nothing for the entire pregnancy. Um, but yeah, how does one, how does one balance being a parent, doing a master's, running a startup? Um, yeah, all of that stuff. Well, my secret is lower the bar of expectations and quality. So, I think uh, you there are two strategies in life. You can be super like best, I don't know, high quality, do everything, perfectionist in one area, or you can be like mm, a bit like in the middle, but in the several areas. So you see, I don't have a great hairstyle. Like <laughs> I barely wash my hair and like, Ideally, I'm going to a podcast that should have a nice haircut, blow dry and so on. But because I have a work, I have kids, like I decided this is kind of not my priority. So I think with parenting, work and study, you just have to understand what is priority for you and then uh, stick to it. Like for me in the morning, it was priority to prepare for this podcast and then spend time with my kids to send them to nursery rather than go and do a blow dry. So just make a list of things that are important and that are not important. And then that's the only way. If you're a perfectionist and you want to work and have a child and have a hobby, you'll be dead. So Anna, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, obviously, congratulations on the round, the the unicorn status. Um, what a time to be at Flow. What a time to be in uh, in women's health, although plenty still to do. I think, yeah, I think what I've got from this is that this is a great milestone. It's a great mas- milestone for you guys. It's a great milestone for women's health in general. I think it it becomes a good milestone I guess if we were to look back in in history, as long as we all use this to talk about women's health more, to talk about femtech more, to talk about, to in, inspire and enable other people to now create companies and to become partners of flow and to help get devices and software and all sorts of innovations to the people that need it. Of course, 70 million users globally, what an awesome statistic that is um and yeah it, uh, as you've pointed out it'd be great to use those uh use that kind of direct relationship with those users to then now push more push more innovation push more impact so yeah um incredibly exciting and of course i wish you all the best with it for those people that want to learn more about you that want to learn more about flow perhaps want to join the team perhaps want to find out more about the raise etc uh, what's the best way for them to learn about Flow? What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? I have a LinkedIn profile, so Excellent. please message me. I'll definitely be interested to talk. And I want to thank you, James, for inviting me here. When I started working for Flow, I was so desperate to find information about how other companies in health tech work, <laughs> how they hire people, how they write job description, how they structure the teams. And there was almost no information people didn't want to share i was trying to you know i was chasing people in linkedin trying to talk <laughs> to someone because like it it was a novel industry there were mm. like few health tech companies um and i was looking at the websites trying to find bits <laughs> of information and then you know like it was such a blessing for me to find uh uh your podcast and also That's like I, I i read emails um so 
like this is the best source of relevant information because I can learn from people who are working in the same industry. And the whole industry is very small and novel. And so far, that's the best source of information I could find. So thank you so much for doing this job because you're improving health literacy for health tech uh, like employees. Well, thank and you. That's, is- uh, that's very kind of you. I think, um, fortunately... I'm the one asking the questions rather than giving the answers. So uh, the credit has to go to all the guests there, I think, more than me. Um, I try and possibly talk about my own story too much on here, but um, I know people want to hear from the guests more than me. But no, thank you for coming on and, and for saying that. It's, it's really kind. I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a funny one Like with this podcast. like I go through phases of um, like sometimes I feel like it's really valuable. Other times I feel like I, you know, m- maybe lose a bit of my mojo on it and that kind of thing but it is it is comments like that 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 keep it going so i really i really appreciate you saying that and i think a load of people have learned from you here and i think the the you're very relatable in the way that you describe like the the way that you've gone about things and and you know very practical advice going into startups and things and that is the exact type of thing that i imagine you've learned from other people so um yeah i really really appreciate it maybe i should turn all the transcripts into some sort of uh into some sort of AI that the people book. can ask questions or a book. Yeah, maybe, maybe a book. That's not a bad idea. You know, there is no book how to structure and how to hire doctors for health tech. Like oh, I go. learned on the go. I was trying to learn from engineers and adapted to medical hiring, <laughs> mm. but actually still the, you know, the information is so, uh, unavailable. Mm. Then like, you know, our CTO, his job is easy because he can, you know, see, like he can get inspiration. His job's easy. Facebook CTO, does. easy, easy job. Easy yeah, job. but I mean, like, you know, all the frameworks are there. They <laughs> yeah, exist yeah, for 30 years. I see what In you mean. clinicians, there are no clinicians for what is career metrics for medical advisors in health tech. Hmm. No, like we, we yeah. developed one at Flaw because there is no ready publicly available um, framework Mm. and any aspect of our work is something that we need to develop from scratch. And when you bring people to the podcast and they share how they solve problems, this is a really cool thing. Mm. Maybe like with like, you don't have millions of subscribers because there are no millions of, you know, CMOs and medical Uh, directors. Not yet yet anyway, not yet. Not yet, but the more you do, the more, the more the industry would grow. Anna, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we will, I'm sure, catch up soon.